hello and welcome to the channel. This is episode 2 where I will be priming, painting, and starting to weather the model. I'll start by using my airbrush to blow off some of the dust that's accumulated. There might be some residue from when I sanded, and I don't want that interfering with my paint. It's a good idea to blow out all these little nooks and crannies. I like to use this Dye Nile Res black primer for most of my projects. And sometimes I'll use a little bit of Flow Aid, and this is just Liquitex brand, which you can get at most art stores, including Michael's. After shaking my primer really well, I'll dispense a little bit into my airbrush cup. I usually mix right in the cup. It saves me a step from having to transfer from something else. I'm going to reduce my primer just a bit with some flow aid. That helps it not clog up the tip of the airbrush. And reducing is just a fancy word for thinning. A lot of guys in automotive and other spray applications will use this word interchangeably. My airbrush is one of the many, many cheap knockoffs you can get on either eBay or Amazon. It's nothing special, and I want to prove that you can do a great job with just basic tools. I have a small tankless compressor and I keep the PSI about 20 to 25. I like to start with these more complex areas. This way you're not dealing with small areas that require more attention and focus than at the end of your project when maybe you're more fatigued. I've found through experience that it's better to start with light coats. I find it helps to build up light coats very gradually and that way you can preserve detail. I'm also going over some of the areas where my filler is exposed. It's a lot more porous than the resin and it'll have a different sheen when you're finished. It's better to cover it more than the surrounding areas. You'll see me occasionally using air from the airbrush without paint to dry down some of the primer that I've applied. I'm not sponsored in any way by this company, but I really like this primer. Not only does it adhere to the printed resin very well, but also other products such as polystyrene. And the opacity of the product is pretty great considering how few coats I put on. After it's dry, you're able to sand it, and it feathers very nicely.
As you can see, I'm always tilting the model in different directions to get the best angle to spray into. Once I feel I've completed all the tough little nooks and crannies, I can start spraying the bigger areas. This is satisfying for a couple reasons. First, because you can spray a large area at once, and secondly, you can relax quite a bit. I usually stick to long, overlapping lines for this coat. For any following coats, I'll usually paint in a perpendicular direction. As you can see, this primer dries down to a really nice sheen. For the next step in the process, I use Tamiya X2 White. Again, I'm using just air out of my airbrush to blow off any of the dust that's settled.
This is pre-thinned and stored in a bottle that's easy to drop into my airbrush. I'm testing a small area on my hand before I get to the model. I'm going to be using the Tamiya white paint in the airbrush to fill in the centers of some of the panels. Mostly on the tops and sides where light would naturally hit these surfaces. Doing this will provide an underlying contrast in the base coat. This doesn't have to be a very precise application. The rougher it looks, the more natural the outcome. This can be a very tedious process, but I like to just relax and let the work flow out. If you make a mistake, you can always go back with some black primer. While I happen to have a lot of experience and practice with an airbrush, this is something that anybody can do. Positioning your model in a certain way will give you a natural shadow. I've seen other artists and modelers refer to this as a zenithal highlight. It's something that shows through very subtly on your base layer. Occasionally some larger chunks will make their way through the airbrush and splatter on your paint. You can see a couple white dots in this shot, and that's what's happened here. Part of being an artist is working around these situations. Sometimes things can happen that are out of our control, and we'll just incorporate them into our project. You've probably seen a few more splatters. And like I said earlier, that's okay. I'm not going to get hung up on it. I'm just going to work through it.
Now that I've completed most of the base coat highlighting, you can start to see where I've avoided panel lines. This is where dirt and grime would collect on an object in real life, and it helps sell the realistic aspect of a model. Not all models have to be dirty and grimy, but this one sure will be. I'm not going to be highlighting the underside of this model with this base coat. This is where shadows would naturally fall and I want them to remain darker. I do want to boost some of the highlights though and that'll help draw your eye to those details once it's painted. Now that my undercoat highlights are done, I'm going to start base coating the model in grey. After a quick test on my hand, I'm ready to start some thin passes. I'm using Tamiya XF19 Sky Grey. While this doesn't match a lot of the TIE fighters that you see in the movies, it does match the AT-ATs and other ground equipment you see in the movies. I thin my Tamiya paints with rubbing alcohol. It helps the paint flow really smoothly out of the airbrush and helps me build up layers because it dries so quickly. I'm being patient here and building up my layers and colors slowly. You can start to see the effect now. The thin grey paint is allowing the contrast to show through. This gives models an aged and realistic appearance. Sometimes modelers will use a technique called post shading, but I find this to be a lot easier.
After giving my eyes a rest, I've noticed that's a few thin spots in the model, so I'll correct those now. Before I start applying washes, I like to apply a clear coat to seal in all the work I've done previous. I'm using Future Floor Polish, but it goes by other names depending on what region you live in. For this step, I'll be misting on a thin coat over the entire model. When this coat is dry, it leaves a somewhat glossy finish. That's going to help your washes pool in the recesses. Again, I'll be using air from the airbrush minus the clear coat to dry off some of the product I've already applied. Balancing your model on a small paint can probably isn't the best idea, but I got lucky this time and nothing bad happened. Next, I'm going to use some Stynile Res Primer in Ebony Flesh to stipple on some chipping in various areas of the model. Places on the model like the loading ramp, the landing feet, and any hard edges will all get chipped. I'm using just a little bit of the primer on the tip of the brush to make small erratic patterns I've seen some modelers and artists use sponges to make a more random pattern, and I'll try that in another video at some point. It can be easy to go overboard and apply too much chipping, or too coarse of a scratch, but you can go over it again with gray paint if you put too much on. I try to keep most of my chipping constrained to areas that make a lot of sense, like on hatches and areas that are directly facing the wind. You can use short brush strokes like this to apply direction in a, in a chip or a scrape. From what I understand, most vehicles in the Star Wars universe have what are called navigational shields, and so you wouldn't see gigantic burn marks from re-entering an atmosphere. Ultimately though, you're the one building in the model, so if you think it looks cool, then go for it. I'm using some of the black we used earlier to darken the brown, and that's going to create some depth in the wear and the chipping. I try not to use anything so fancy as a palette. Right now I'm just using the bottom of this tin, which I wipe off after every session.
In this step, I'm using this Micron pen in a sepia color to add some very fine dots around the weathering. You can also run this pen along hard edges to represent a scrape. Tamiya makes this panel line accent color. I'll be using brown and black here to accent the panel lines. The brushes that I'm using here are of no particular brand variety. It was just a pack of a bunch that I got off eBay. Nothing special. This just goes to show that you don't have to have all the finest tools. Some of my best dry brushes are actually used, old makeup brushes that my wife donated to my hobby. At first I'm very careful with my applications, but as I get more impatient I start to get sloppier. But that's okay, we can fix this with some thinner. On some models that I've built in the past, the panel liner works amazingly. It just flows right into all the panel lines without any effort. That isn't the case in my experience with 3D printed models though. The resin tends to be a little more granular and doesn't allow for a smooth capillary action. This is going to dilute the wash a little bit and make it a little more subtle. In some areas I have to be a little coarser with my application of the wash because it just won't flow. This process is usually always the same for me. I start out very patiently, and then I quickly lose that and start applying it very casually. The wash comes in really handy for adding shadows to these intake vents. Depending on the outcome you want, you could start adding wash liberally like I am here and it will act like more of a filter once it dries. If you're using a few different colors in your models, this can help tie them together.
After you're happy with your model's wash, it's time to walk away and let it dry. Join me in episode 3 to see how I clean this model up and apply a flat coat. Thank you very much for watching.